Uh, next, I'm um, going to introduce Alexander Decker, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Professor John Gabrielli at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT. Her talk today is entitled Reward, Reward Processing in Children is Impacted by Socioeconomic Status. Great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's such a pleasure to be talking to you all today. Um, we've heard from some really, really inspiring speakers about how factors like early life stress and a lack of resources can really, really shape development. And oh, yeah. And um, one factor that I'm going to be talking about today that we've touched on already um, it's related to all these other factors, is um, socioeconomic status. So the social resources and the economic resources that we have at our disposal that really affect outcomes. Um, so it's indexed by things like education and wealth and income. And socioeconomic status is really, really important to consider because, as we've heard, it's related to a lot of things that really, really affect development. So for example, on average, you know, no two child's experience, children's spirit experience is the same, but on average, children who grew up in lower socioeconomic backgrounds tend to experience higher levels of stress due to things, you know, like financial insecurity or food insecurity. They have fewer resources at their, disposable, uh, at their disposal to make this stress controllable. So, I mean, everyone experiences stress, whether you're wealthy, whether you're poor, but um, having resources that can make this, that allow you to actually address the stress and make it controllable can make a huge difference. And last, um, there's huge disparities in access to really enriching opportunities that foster very, very favorable outcomes, so access to educational resources, for example, private tutoring. And this can impact how children feel about how much control they have over their outcomes. So um, hardship combined with a lack of coping resources can make children feel um, less powerful to affect um, outcomes in their lives. And this is important because it, it can directly shape outcomes. So for example, children who grow up poor are much, much more likely to suffer from mental health illnesses and much, much more likely to struggle with behavioral difficulties. And these disparities in outcome also extend into the academic realm. So I think this figure is really, really powerful. It shows um, sixth grade academic achievement scores in dis different districts in New York. And what you can see is this uh, apparent socioeconomic status is really, really related to academic achievement. And this relationship is so strong that if you compare um, the poorest to the wealthiest districts, there's grade level differences um, of about between four and six grade levels. And so the big question I think a lot of us are trying to answer today, because um, we all want to affect change in this arena is why is this? What accounts, what contributes to these huge disparities in outcomes? And um, one avenue that we've been hearing today that researchers often pursue is to look at um, the brain of children from higher and lower socioeconomic backgrounds um, and see how they differ. Um, but not necessarily to look in all areas of the brain, but to look in areas of the brain that we know are sensitive to correlates of socioeconomic status, um, like uncontrollable stress or um, fewer, having fewer resources. And when we look at animal models of stress, what we often find are changes uh, in many, many different areas of the brain, um, but one um, system that I'm going to be talking about today that we've heard a little a bit about already is we tend to see changes in those areas of the brain that are involved in motivation and reward. And in particularly, in animal models of stress, we often see um, changes in reward sensitivity. So animals become less sensitive to potential gains and losses in their environments. And this is accompanied by behavioral changes as well. Um, so like mice seem to exhibit behavior suggesting they feel less control over their outcomes and um, sort of depression-like behavior. And this is really important because being sensitive to rewards uh, affects all sorts of things in our lives. So as an example, um, being sensitive to rewards might motivate us to study extra hard um, for an exam 
to strive for a promotion, to impress a date. It also affects cognition. So for example, um, being sensitive to rewards might encourage us to pay attention when it really, really matters, to learn, and to consolidate memories of important events. And last, reward sensitivity has shown to play a really important role in mental health. And um, as an example, depression, what we tend to see in um, people who are depressed, if we give them the re rewards, they tend to be, and we look at their brain, we tend to see lower reward sensitivity, this blunted um, response. And so um, reward sensitivity seems to be really important for our cognition, for behavior, and for mental health. And so what I've told you so far is children from lower socioeconomic economic backgrounds tend to experience more stress, less opportunity than those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. And these factors um, are related to things like reward sensitivity in the brain. Um, what we wanted to know was, do these, these animal models of stress, do they translate to humans? And is it the case that when we compare kids from lower and higher socioeconomic backgrounds, do we see differences in reward sensitivity in, in their brain? And this was important for us to look at because we know reward sensitivity is so related to all these important behaviors, cognition, mental health. So to answer this question, we focus specifically on a brain region that's really, really implicated um, in reward, the striatum. And, um, what we tend to see in animal models is stress leads to smaller striatal volume and also reduced reward sensitivity. And so what we wanted to know, we wanted to take this to humans and ask, um, you know, in um, children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, do they show differences in their brain um, in, in this reward system area? Specifically, uh, we wanted to ask whether they had smaller striatal volumes, and also uh, we wanted to ask whether the striatum was less sensitive to rewards. So to answer these questions, what we needed was we needed to collect data from um, a group of individuals who differ, came from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We were really interested in development in particularly, so we focused our efforts on adolescents. We need to take a picture of their brain and specifically to look at um, brain structure, take a picture of their brain to look at the size of the striatum. And we also needed to record brain activity while they're doing some sort of task where they're receiving rewards. So we can compare brain activity to, um, during a reward task in um, kids from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And so what we did was we recruited data from 120 adolescents. They range from tw uh, 12 to 15 years of age. Uh, we, we collected measures of their, their parents' socioeconomic status here, um, income and education. And I'm just showing um, the range of income and education variables. So you can see um, our sample had quite a range um, from about 10,000 to, for, in terms of income, from about 10,000 to well over a million per year. Um, Parental education, there was also quite a range. Some kids' parents had completed high school or less, and others had, had done professional or doctoral degrees. So the first uh, big discovery we, we made was um, looking at brain structure. So here I'm going to show you a child's socioeconomic status uh, plotted against um, the size of their striatum. And here, this is what the data look like. So there's tons of variability in, in this plot. But in general, what we see is kids from higher socioeconomic backgrounds show bigger volume in this region. And this is sort of ex exactly what we see in animal models of stress. Um, so um, animals that are stressed tend to see, um, show smaller volumes in this region. So the next thing we wanted to know was how does the striatum respond differently to rewards? And to answer this question, we needed them to be doing a reward task while we recorded brain activity. And I'm going to walk you through that really quickly right now. Um, so the task, they're actually gambling money. So they have to guess whether um, a forthcoming number will be bigger or smaller than five. 
Um, the number is always between uh, one and nine. And if they're right, they get a reward. And if they're wrong, they lose. So here's just an example of what, what happens. So they see this question mark. They know a number is going to appear. They take a guess. On some trials, they might guess, oh, I think the number will be bigger than five. Then they see the actual number. If they're right, they get uh, positively reinforced. And they're also told that they're going to receive a dollar um, for each time, they're, each time they're right that will be added to an overall pool of money that they're already receiving. If they're wrong, sometimes they're wrong, uh, they'll receive um, negative feedback. And they're told they're losing 50 cents um, from a pool of money they're receiving. And this task was rigged, so everyone actually had the same experience of winning and losing throughout the task. Um, but they didn't know that. So they really cared about you know, winning, winning the money. And this is a pretty well-validated task. So what we generally see when we compare, when we look at the brain while people are doing this task, we generally see higher activity in the striatum when people are winning than when they're losing. So this is an actual data. This is just like a toy example. You might see something like this, where like striatal activity is much, much higher for these reward trials than lost trials. And what we're really interested in here is this difference um, that I'm going to be calling reward sensitivity. So if your striatum is really sensitive to reward, it'll be really um, much more active during while it's being rewarded. All right, so we thought there could be three possible outcomes. One possibility is that we wouldn't find any difference by socioeconomic status. You know, maybe there aren't differences in reward sensitivity. Maybe the animal models that we're thinking about don't necessarily translate to humans. Second possibility is, you know, maybe counter to what we might expect, maybe lower socioeconomic would be, status would be associated with greater reward sensitivity on, on this task, especially because, you know, maybe they have less disposable uh, money available. And so the value of a dollar is much more rewarding, maybe, to people who are um, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And the third possibility is that lower socioeconomic status would correlate with less reward sensitivity um, due to the uh, possibly the greater stress and reduced control over outcomes experienced by children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So now I'm going to show you what we found. Um, so I'm plotting here socioeconomic status against reward sensitivity. And this is what the data looked like. So each participant here is a dot. And again, there's a lot of variability in this plot. But in general, what we see is this positive correlation between socioeconomic status and reward sensitivity, um, suggesting that the regions of the brain that are um, involved in reward processing are less sensitive to reward in kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And so this data suggests that you know, socioeconomic status might influence the reward system in the brain both by reducing the volume of the striatum and decreasing sensitivity to rewards. And it's important to note, you know, in this study, we didn't have a measure of stress, but this finding is consistent with a stress mechanism. So chronic stress, we know, has been associated um, with altered um, structure and function of the striatum. Um, and this alteration is associated with uh, mental health outcomes like depression. And so one possibility is that stress and um, reduced resources in childhood might actually alter the volume and reward sensitivity of this region. And this could, you know, there's so many different factors at play here, but this could play a small role in increasing kids' risk of um, depression. And I want to briefly emphasize um, some exciting work that's now being done in, in the field, so people are um, starting to test whether things like early um, intervening with, with um, cash um, gifts actually changes the relationship we, we observe between socioeconomic status um, and brain development. So can we actually mitigate the influence? And um, some studies are showing yes. There's also some work being done showing that you know when you look across different states with different social benefits, we see um, that in states with greater social benefits, you know, expanded Medicaid, um, 
poverty reduction programs, these differences in the brain um, are, are smaller. And so I just want to quickly thank um, the people who really helped out, uh, my advisor, John Gabrielli, who is so instrumental in this project, as well as Steven Meisler, who helped with a lot of the pre-processing of the fMRI data, the, Gab the whole Gabrielli lab, who um, has been really supportive and has helped collect a lot of the data, and all of the amazing families that participated in this work. Thanks so much. Time for a few questions. Thanks so much, that was really great. Um, if I understood correctly, the, the reward sensitivity calculation was a difference between uh, the, the positive rewarded and the, the negative rewarded tasks. I'm wondering if you can tell if that's actually a difference in the sensitivity of reward or mm -hmm. the sensitivity to the loss. Yeah, so in this particular paradigm, no, we didn't have a neutral condition. Um, a neutral condition would be really informative, though, for um, teasing apart whether that difference, in sense, difference between rewards and losses is due to um, greater reward sensitivity and greater loss sensitivity. Um, or um, reduced. So um, there's been there's a lot of like big data sets out there um, that have there's I think one that I can think of that has actually used this paradigm that were th could be really useful for looking at that. Um, but this data is consistent with like other studies that have shown reduced reward sensitivity in kids from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in different areas of the reward system, like the orbital frontal cortex, for example. Um, so I think that. Um, if we were predicting based on other work, we would think that it's um, driven by the reward trials. Thanks so much. <laughs>